greatness requires a huge amount of sweat equity. <laughs> so it ain't, it ain't ever going to be easy. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Red Man Music and Business.com. My name is Steve Rennie, and I am the Red Man, and this little program is called Red Man Live. Um, hey, if you're looking to do something great in this music business, uh, don't drop your microphone. You might need that later. Uh, but you have come to the right place <laughs> for all kinds of advice. Uh, our guest today is Grammy Award winning producer and songwriter Glenn Ballard, who is here today to talk about his long successful career in the music business and to offer some advice and counsel to all our musician friends out there. Um, Unlike most of these shows out there, you see, folks, we want you to actually be part of the act here. And over the course of the last almost three years now, we've had some of the smartest, most talented folks in the music business join us here to talk about today's business. Today is our 110th webcast against all odds. And what makes that show unique, as I said, is that we want you to be part of it. And that means asking questions. We've got a saying around the joint here. If you haven't seen it before, take note. It you don't ask, you don't get. You won't learn anything, folks. So take advantage of this opportunity to uh, talk to another one of the smart folks in the business. Uh, Kira O'Neill, uh, our wonderful team, let me introduce them before we get going. Over in the corner there on the video control, the, the keyboards, is Cody Romness. We refer to him as the Trojan Man. Uh, and his softer more sensitive counterpart over there. <laughs> if you believe that, you don't know. <laughs> Kira, Kira O'Neill. Kira's going to handle the chat room. Tell the folks, Kira, how they can get involved today, would you please? Okay, so you can go to Renman MB and sign up. You have to be a registered member. Post your questions in advance on the live event page, or you can chat with me in the crowd surfing chat room. Uh, be sure to hashtag Renman Live, and it'll hit the Twitter feed. Any links you want to share, get involved in the conversation. That it'll hit the feed there, and then you can call in, of course, uh, call into the hotline. And if you call in, you know we got a, we got some surprises for you. <laughs> what, they, what can they what win the today? Kid? What yeah. can they win today? I'm gonna promote the shirt today. <laughs> Sorry, this I was is, rearranging my yeah, desk over like, here, putting you microphones back. Come on. Um, you'll get this lovely <clears throat> "Fuck the Gatekeeper" shirt with Young Ren on the front. That's it's, not Young Ren. That's some '70s porn star, Kira. Well, <clears throat> wasn't that what you were doing in the '70s? <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Just right. keep going here. All right, and then we have uh, the "Dream It, Do It" for the you know less vulgar types. <laughs> You know, I was going to say types. the more sensitive type. Sensitive? But, you know, okay. Less yeah, vulgar, I guess that works. sensitive. All right. And what, uh, we showed him the hotline number and all that stuff. Good stuff. All right. uh, Kira, thanks for joining us here today. Um, all right, folks. Let's take care of some business. Now we've taken care of the business. Let's get down to business. Uh, our guest today is one of the most successful musicians, songwriters, record producers, music persons in the music business over the last 30 years. He's won six Grammy Awards for his work with some of the biggest artists on the planet, from Alanis Morissette to Barbara Streisand to Michael Jackson, Aerosmith, one of my favorites, Van fucking Halen, uh, and to, to one of today's biggest pop stars, Katy Perry. He's written and produced some of the biggest songs and albums literally in the history of the music business, and he's worked in film and theater as well. He's here today to share his experience and insight with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. Glenn Ballard. Glenn, thanks for joining us here. here. Thanks for really? joining us here today. Oh, here we go. Okay. Warm thank round of so applause much. here. Um, first off, let me say uh, thank you for joining us here today. I always uh, appreciate it when people take time out of their day to uh, come and share their knowledge for, for, for no pay. Uh, and, and what, so, I'm not getting paid? No, no Wait pay. a minute. Well, there might be some small residuals, but uh, I'm, I'm told it's a little like the music business. It's tough to find them. Oh. Uh, so at any rate, um, so again, thanks for coming in here. Um, I've been watching your career from a distance, or not as from a distance, but aware of what you're doing, and so it's finally, uh, it's fun to actually get a chance to uh, meet. Um, and we spoke on the phone the other day, and I told you, most of the folks that are checking out our show are people that are dreaming about doing something big in, in this music business. And as I'm sure you and I would agree that the dreaming winds up being the easy part. The getting started and the doing is a little bit tougher. And we've now had 110 shows, and I've asked everybody the same question that I'm going to ask you, which is, how did Glenn Ballard get started in this music business? 
Well, let's talk about the dreaming part to start okay. with. Mm -hmm. um, I dreamed about making music my whole life, so I think that's the predicate for anybody mm -hmm. in music, that they want to make music. If you don't want to make music, why would you do it? So mm -hmm. um, the act of making music is as simple as finding an instrument or just opening your mouth and singing. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you can kind of develop uh, in the privacy of your own home, as, it's, as it were. So for me, it started with the dream of sitting at a piano, trying to satisfy my own curiosity about why, mm -hmm. these, why certain notes sounded good together and why certain notes didn't. Mm -hmm. So it started with me with a simple, pure sort of conundrum of trying to understand this wonderful thing called music. Mm -hmm. And I think that investigation continues to this moment, in fact. <laughs> uh, because I think learning about this magic thing called music is really what I've been involved with. So I'm here to say that I'm learning a little bit each day mm -hmm. and hopefully I have to, I'll learn something even more tomorrow. So Were, Did you have parents or somebody that introduced you? you had, it sounds like you had a piano around the house. I had a piano. My uh, aunt tragically died when I was 12 years old and I inherited a grand piano as a result. So her demise as tragic as it was, led to my being able to be the, the gift of a piano in my home. Mm. So I think that was it. It was, it was actually having a piano that sounded good. And mm. so it, the gift of, as, as Joni Mitchell would say, broken trees and elephant ivories put together into this instrument mm. represented what music was to me. Mm. And so the idea of approaching it with excitement and humility and curiosity was really, it's, it's, it's really all about me as a musician. Mm -hmm. I think that's the predicate. Was there a point sometime in your youth there where, you know, because a lot, you know, we were talking earlier, people have different things that they enjoy doing. I love playing golf, yours was music. Did you have a sense early on that, that, that this was a little bit more than, I'm just fascinated, this is what I want to do for my life? Did that strike you earlier or is that something that no. just kind of grew on you? No, because I, I had no idea, uh, I grew up in Natchez, Mississippi, I had no idea how one made a living making music mm -hmm. other than sort of the local combos that were in town, all of whom, you know, sort of weekend musicians and who sort of did regular things during the week. What struck me about where I'm from is that a lot of people did music. They mm -hmm. did music as a way of life. Mm -hmm. So the vocabulary of making noise in a joyful way is something that, while I was not around people who were necessarily doing it for a living, they mm -hmm. were doing it for love. Mm -hmm. So my sense of music comes out of that. It's a pure joyful experience and a pure expressive thing. And so the idea that I would be able to actually make money from it, no, it didn't occur to me. Mm -hmm. it, it was something that I just wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I was certain that I would have to make my money somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because um, I'm often asked, you know, we have a website where people can post questions. So I have this ear to what young independent artists are thinking today. And one of the questions I'm asked most often is how important location is in terms of success in the music business. There's lots of talented people out there in the world. You're living proof that they don't all live in those major music areas. What ultimately inspired you? Because, you know, Natchez, I did a little homework here today, and I noticed that there's 15,000 people in Natchez. So that is definitely would qualify as a small town, right? And yet, you know, you've managed to have success. What inspired you or drove you, or did you realize that you had to leave Natchez um, if you were gonna try to do something in the music business? It's an epiphany I had probably the day I graduated from college, mm -hmm. but it's, if it were happening right now, I probably would have a different epiphany. It was clear to me in 1975 when I graduated that there were a few centers of music, Nashville, New York, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the idea that y you could sort of engender any kind of musical foment any other place was actually not really mm -hmm. gonna happen. I mean, you, there were local music scenes everywhere. But it's, it's, the difference is, is that the world was different then. Mm -hmm. So making music as a profession sort of involved you being around the centers of music, the three places that I just talked about. So it was obvious to me as I looked down the road to adulthood that I was either going to have a, a profession that everyone sort of recognized as being 
a legitimate one, or I would take my chances on being a musician. So it was either Nashville, New York, or LA. I loved the weather in LA. I took a left turn, I went to LA, and so in 1975, that was a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I found myself in probably the most creative time and place for music, maybe in the history of music. There was so much great music happening here and so many great musicians who were making records, making music for movies and television shows. So yes, it, in 1975 it was important to be in Los Angeles. Mm. In 2015, I think it would still be important to be in a place like LA or New York or Nashville, but completely not necessary mm. because obviously you can talk to me and I can talk to you. Wherever you may be right now, you may be in Sioux Falls, mm -hmm. or you may be in Moline, or you may be in Miami, or you may be around the corner, but we can all talk to each other now. Yeah. So that's no small miracle. That, that epiphany and, and the results of that have changed the world utterly. So anytime we talk about my experiences in the old music business, it's... It must be viewed with great caution because mm. I, I don't necessarily think it's a blueprint for the future. Interesting to hear you say that because I find myself as, as, a, a, as a veteran of the music business that you know some of the things that were tried and true that I would have never questioned, I question all the time the relevance of my past experience. I don't dismiss it outright, but I'm, 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 I'm dubious about whether it's gonna be relevant. And it sounds like you're a, of the same mind on that. Listen, I, so many profound changes have happened in my lifetime, and I'm privileged to have been able to witness all of it. I think the first one is, is obviously the connectivity that we all have with each mm. other. Uh, and the gatekeepers of media and culture have been sort of, they're competing with everybody else now mm. for your time and your mm. interest. And it's, it's been a kind of a daunting thing for, for all of us who are sort of in the business of mm -hmm. creating art for people to consume. Uh, so for me, it's always got to be about the work itself, not necessarily about how it gets mm -hmm. to, that's the second thing for me. Yeah. The most important thing is the content itself. Mm -hmm. The forms in which it gets delivered are going to change in ways that we can't even predict. Mm -hmm. But what isn't going to change is the yearning in the human heart for great, great storytelling great melodies, great songs that connect with characters, that connect with situations that we all can relate to. None of that's changed. It, it mm. seems like the world has changed utterly, but the human heart remains the, exactly the same. Yeah. And, uh, and with the same needs for, for, for the harmonic richness of music. So, I mean, the most important thing, if, if you're moving forward right now as a musician, is to, is to remain musical. We need music. Yeah. Everybody makes noise now, but musicians actually have this extra thing that they can do that on some level we've kind of devalued a little bit in this exact moment of the zeitgeist because on some level in the pop sort of headline world that we live, there isn't enough room for a big melody mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. but it only takes about 10 seconds. So yeah. I'm of the mind that melodic and harmonic content has just been sort of on hold right now and it's getting mm -hmm. ready to come back into the marketplace in a big way. So I want to talk some more about your, your whole thoughts on songwriting and what makes a great song. But it was interesting, you know, you talk about things that have changed and things that haven't changed. Um, it was true back in 75, it's still true today that, you know, if you're looking to do something big, whether it's a music business or technology, whatever, um, you, you need some help. And so that means trying to meet people. And, and so when particularly you came from a small town in Mississippi, this idea of networking, how are you going to meet people in the business is important. Uh, Again, small world we find. Glenn and I spoke the other day before the show, and we were talking about your trip out here. To, to Los Angeles, and you mentioned, I said, yeah, I see you're from Mississippi. I only know one other guy from Mississippi, and it turns out we knew the same guy. Tell that story about yes. your first phone call out here in, in Los Angeles. Well, I, it, there can be no doubt that I've lived an incredibly lucky and charmed life, and this is just another element of, of the charmed life I've lived. In 1975, I graduated from Ole Miss, and I had absolutely no contacts in Los Angeles. So my dear 
departed uncle Ed Henson, who was a basketball player at Ole Miss and a wonderful golfer, happened to know someone who was a golfer in California, and his name was Eddie Marins. It turns out he was the golf pro at the Bel Air Country Club. There he is right there. Oh my God, fantastic. <laughs> With the king, so, sorry, I mean, back to camera one coach. Believe it or not, Eddie and I have never met, but I owe everything that has ever happened to me in music starts with Eddie Marins because mm -hmm. I arrived in Los Angeles in probably June of 1975 and I had one phone number in my pocket. <laughs> I love this. Eddie Marins and whatever the number was. Mm. And so I used it. I called mm -hmm. Eddie Marins the second day I arrived in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, introduced myself, said that I was Ed Henson's nephew and that, and of course he remembered my uncle. Mm -hmm. They had done golf tournaments together and Eddie graciously said, you know, I teach a golfer named Tutti Camerata. He owns a studio in Hollywood. I'll call him and maybe you can go by and see him. And literally, that began my career. Thank you. Two days later, I'm with Tutti Camerata at his studio, Sunset Sound, and the rest is history for me. I mm -hmm. mean, literally, that led to me meeting someone who was working with Elton John. Elton John was looking for people to work. <laughs> I said, I will... I'll answer the phone, I'll do anything you want. I, I just wanna make myself useful. Mm -hmm. So the best advice I have for anyone is try to make yourself useful to any, anybody at any time. Yeah. And, and pretty soon you, you become indispensable. Yeah, and don't discount your golfing friends out there. <laughs> Every connection is important. Yeah. I mean, we're all, <laughs> we're it's, all connected in some way or another, yeah. so. And it's funny, I, was, I saw uh, the little pro who I take golf lessons from, or not so much golf lessons, we talk about the game the same way we're talking about music right now. It's not technique, well, he, he has a wonderful perspective on it. And I told him that we met, and he, he sent along his regards there. So now you two have, well, you've seen Eddie, I'm gonna make sure he sees a bit of this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna to have to do it low tech style for him, Cobra. We're gonna make sure the pro gets a chance to see it. Let me talk about another thing um, that I find important. And as I was reading through your, your, your great history in the music business, um, I talk about it a lot. Uh, and in some ways I try to play mentor with this web show and, and, and our website because I benefited mightily by having some mentors that took an interest in me early in my career and really kind of helped paint my perspective on all sides. When you did come out to California, you did use those networking tools and started meeting those people. You got hooked up with MCA Publishing, I think, back in the day. And through that, somehow met a gentleman by the name of Quincy mm -hmm. Jones, who, best I could tell, sounded like he was a mentor. Talk about that, if you would. Well, Quincy Jones is the greatest gift I've ever had working in music. Uh, he essentially taught me everything I know about making records and about the approach to making records. Um, so, and uh, another part of my charmed history involves how I met Quincy. Um, I mean, there's it, a great songwriter named Rod Temperton who wrote the mm -hmm. song Thriller, Rock With You. He was essentially Quincy Jones, Billy Strahan, you know, <laughs> Strayhorn. And um, so on some level, my publishers at MCA Music felt that Glenn Ballard songs would find a great home in the Quincy Jones world. And so my publisher, Rick Shoemaker, made it his business to find out a way to get my songs to Quincy. So he very sm smartly, instead of pitching it to Quincy, pitched it to Rod Temperton, who was himself a songwriter, which is not a, a necessarily an intuitive approach. Mm -hmm. But as it turned out, it was actually the right approach because Rick pitched Rod a couple of my songs and Rod actually liked them. It was a song called What's On Your Mind, slightly jazzy, but he thought, you know, Quincy's producing George Benson. This might be good for him. So literally, Rod Temperton pitched my song to Quincy, who is himself one of the great songwriters and a far greater songwriter than I'll ever be. And he pitched the song to Quincy and Quincy liked it I get a call, this is probably 1982, from Quincy Jones, and it's like the happiest call I've ever gotten. It was on an answer phone, I probably kept it for three years. <laughs> Glenn, this is Quincy Jones, and it was like, wait a minute, that can't play be. that again. Glenn, this is yeah. Quincy Jones. Yeah. Yeah. So from that moment, I began my relationship with him. I, I, he asked me to come down, he said, we're gonna do this song, What's On Your Mind with George Benson. So 
they were working at Westlake on Beverly Boulevard, and I began my long association with Quincy that day, probably early 80s. And Rod Temperton, again, the great songwriter that he is, as, as my fellow songwriter, he, he couldn't have helped me anymore. And then it began my relationship with Quincy, who anyone who's ever known him knows that he is, he's all love, he's a genius, and he f has a wonderful way of getting the best out of everyone around him. Mm. So that's what I, I learned that from the downbeat. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a great talent that I, I always wa as watching Quincy Jones from a distance. He always seemed to be the delegate. He always seemed to be surrounded by talented people. And I never got the feeling that he was a dictator, where sometimes you, know, no. you work with people and you kind of feel it. And, and to hear that confirmed is, is great stuff. Uh, we got any questions in the chat room there, uh, Kira? Yes, we do. Okay, okay, let's take one, and then we're going to do a little uh, business <laughs> over here. Take okay, we, we got a lot of questions, so I have to be very selective here. I'm sorry, now your folks. phone's ringing. <laughs> Jesus, okay. So, Rennie, you talk a lot about building your professional team. Um, Gary T. from Indiana would like to know how Glenn builds his team and how like, a singer, song, like songwriter, producer would build his team. Take it away, Mr. Ballard. Well, I think the first thing right now is, uh, is getting fluent with some kind of, of a digital platform to create the music. I mean, I work... Uh, in Logic, I, but there, and I recommend Logic, but there's many, many platforms that you can sort of begin with. And that's, that's the first member of your team mm. is, is a piece of equipment. <laughs> and, Reliable, low overhead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it needs a lot of electricity and a lot of software updates. The care and feeding is up to you. But uh, you start with that because, look, that is the great empowering tool. I mean, the fact that we're, we're broadcasting here, even though this isn't NBC, we are competing with NBC, mm -hmm. let's, let's face yeah. it. So um, that's the first thing. So I would say, get logic. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful way of, it's actually such an empowering place mm -hmm. to start. So, and if you're, if you're into the visual side, uh, there, there are many programs that integrate with Logic that I, I highly recommend, if, you know, because I think part of being in music now is also the video side mm -hmm. of it. So for me, you start with probably a, a digital camera, a Can keyboard. 5D, so well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you sort of like have to have the tools to be in the game. And that isn't, uh, I mean, the, the price point for that is getting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. I mean, you start with a computer, right? So I mean, I think that's your first thing is getting some sense of fluency with the tech, and I don't have to tell people that now. I mean, that's how, that's that's kind of obvious, but on some level, getting to the next level of fluency with that is hugely important mm -hmm. as a musician. I mean, I work with Logic every day, and it it's a daunting thing to keep up with it, mm -hmm. but it's so empowering. It, it there, there's no substitute for that. That's your first step. <clears throat> if you're making music. Obviously, you want, as part of your team, you want to make great songs. I mean, mm, obviously, yeah. songs That's everything. are the lifeblood. I mm. mean, there are so many new songs in the marketplace right now, but there are not so many great new songs. Mm. The ones that are really great are the ones that will, that will stand out. So <clears throat> for me, it starts in the creative realm of hopefully finding somebody that understands how to create music, how to create songs, and, and is willing to commit the time to it because this is like, this is a life's work. This is mm -hmm. not like something you just sort of like do and expect to get a result right away. You sort of have to be invested in it for the long term. So, <clears throat> I mean, look, I used to have a record company, a small record company, and we had 15 employees. <clears throat> what I'm doing now, I call music branding, and I have a much smaller company. I have an incredibly capable and brilliant person running the company named Angela Vicari, who has background in music. We're also working uh, in television, film, and theater. So I think a broad background, mm -hmm. certainly going forward with someone who can understand the ever-changing landscape is like huge. So having one person to run my company is like huge. I, I work with a couple of recording engineers uh, who kind of keep everything running. And so, with a small group of people, we can basically create a product 
and we can find ways for that product to get into the marketplace. And I used to have to do that with 15 or 20 mm -hmm. people. I can actually do it with three or four people now. Yeah, I think today if you're running a small business to that gentleman out there, and getting a, getting a great team together is important. And you talked about Quincy and you've got your team. Um, using all the tools of the trade today, technology are, are reducing the cost and giving you wider reach than ever before. And as I say it around here all the time, Cody's a living example of it. Today, it seems to me the universal language is the digital world. You know, if, you, if you're not adept at, at you know, making music Music and creating the visuals, and, and you're, you're missing something to the people that have talent and, and those skills as well. Speaking of those skills, we're going to take a break here for a second and pay a couple of bills here. <clears throat> uh, most of the folks that are watching the show here are interested in learning about the music business. So for years, everybody said, hey, you should write a book. I'm like, write a book? I can't even write a freaking memo. Are you kidding me? So I decided to put it all on video. So um, we built this course. It's called Ren Man U Insider's Guide to Today's Music Business. It's an online course that I put together that is 150 plus video lessons that give you a great overview of today's music business, how to get a record deal, how to make you know, music, what, what, you know, how to build that team and so forth and so on. And it's a great resource for all you folks that are out there looking to learn about the music business. You don't need to spend tens of thousands of dollars in four years of your life at a university to get a piece of paper that might not get you as much as uh, initiative and dedication will. Um, there are a couple different versions of the course. Uh, there's a solo version for you folks that like to work cheap and on your own. And we also have what's known as the mentor version where you can get all the benefits of the course, but you also get a chance to uh, interact with our students on a weekly Google hang out and ask real questions. Um, if you're interested, go to our website at www.renmanu.com to learn more. And while you're there, I hope you'll take our free Music Biz IQ test and see if you've got what it takes to, to make it in the music business. Try our free demo while you're there. And on the event page, there'll be a link to a webinar explaining how that all works. And on cue, the phone <laughs> rings here. While you're taking that one, Kira, I'm going to move ahead. Um, you have worn so many different hats, songwriter, label person, musician, and so forth. Um, I want to talk about your role as a producer. Once you got hooked up with Quincy, great person to teach you about, you started getting producing gigs on your own. One was your first single was with a friend of ours, Jack Wagner, who, who had a big hit. But you also had some big hits with Wilson Phillips on their record. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about that mindset of the producer. As opposed to being a musician or a songwriter, how would you distinguish the role of a producer in that mix? And were you able to just be producer, or did you wind up mixing and matching all those hats? For me, I very often am writing songs in conjunction with the production. So, but either whether I wrote the song or whether I didn't, the producing of it to me is, I think for most people, you could relate it to a film director. A film director uh, has the creative responsibility for all of it. But you, typically in film, the film producer has the financial responsibility mm -hmm. for the product. What's different about a record producer is that a record producer is not only the creative director, he's also the financial director. So you, the, the record producer has to keep the budget in line and make a great product. So you have a lot of responsibility. And if you go over budget, it's on you. If you're a director and you go over budget, it's usually on the producer. And it's up to the producer to keep mm -hmm. the director in line. For me as a producer, I have to keep the director in line when I'm making a record, which is... So it's, it's about managing the creative mm. output and, and also making sure that you don't spend too much money on it. So that's mm. what being a record producer mm. is. Yeah. That's on a, just on a basic level. The most important thing a record producer does for me is, pick, is help pick the material. The material is everything. I mean, you can, if you give me 10 mediocre songs, mm. I, I could spend a lot of time on that and it would be okay. If you give me one great song, I could spend almost no time on it and it would probably be a hit because I really believe success and failure is built into the DNA mm. of the writing. Mm. So for me as a, as a producer, my biggest job is always going back to the material and, and making sure that the potential for that is as great as it can be. Mm. And 
that's part of what having vision for what a, a piece of material may be in its raw form and what you think it could become mm. after you produce it. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of a mysterious process. I mean, I, the most fun for me is to be in a room full of musicians and to have a mission statement, which is the song, and for us all to be rowing together with an artist singing, I mean, it's, that's why I do it. Mm -hmm. Anytime I get the opportunity to do that, that's what I want to do. Uh, it, it sounds great. So we take questions uh, from some of our folks that uh, are, are smart enough to post ahead online. So we had one question that, that kind of spoke to some of the nuts and bolts of the producer. They want to make sure we ask that. Yeah. Here's the question. It says, hi, Glenn. I'm a singer, songwriter, solo act. I shortened this down a little bit there, Corey. Pardon me. I'm a singer, songer, songwriter, solo act. My questions are as follows. How do I find a producer? What should I be looking for and what types of questions should I be asking? How do producers make money or better yet? How much is it going to cost for me to get one? Do producers do spec deals? Thanks for help. We, our users usually ask multiple questions like they're not going to get another crack. So take a stab at any of those. Um, <laughs> what are the questions of, uh, when an artist is looking at a producer, what should they talk about when they get that meeting? I, I, it depends on what your goals are. I'm, honestly, it's making music now is something that can happen so routinely and anyone can do it. So the biggest question is, what do you want to do with your music? Why are you, do you want to make a record? What's the goal for it? I mean, there used to be a very clear reason to make records. You would get them on the radio, people would go out and buy the record. Mm -hmm. Now that cause and effect doesn't really happen. So making recordings of music, first question is, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to try to get on the radio? And if you do, how do you find a producer? First thing I would do is listen to all my favorite songs and go, who produced these 10 songs? Those are the 10 people that produced it. So that's the first step of investigation. But it's very likely that if you're an unknown artist, getting someone like that to produce you is gonna be remote. But the style of that producer is really what you're talking about. What that record sounds like that you like so much, find out who produced it and maybe there's somebody who's just coming up that has a similar style mm -hmm. who might be more open to a new artist. Uh, you have to be resourceful. I mean, um, everybody wants Quincy Jones to produce their record, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, there were times when people who wanted Quincy Jones to produce it, and he would give them me. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and I would try to sub for him as best I could. And that so, worked out. And it I worked mean, out yeah. for both of us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I think that's the first step is, what do you want to do with it? And secondly, what what do you think that producer can do for you? I mean, mm -hmm. and thirdly, how much does it cost? It, it should cost a lot less than it used to, I can tell you <laughs> that. Um, I mean, part of it is, it begins with, is the song good enough to even mm -hmm. yeah. spend enough money and time to go in and do it? I mean, honestly, that's the, the biggest question is, is the, is the material worthy of it? Mm -hmm. And I think, that's the most important question of all. And if it is, then I feel like it's worth, it's worth your while to go and try to figure out how to make a record out if, of it. If you, if somebody, and I'm not putting you on the spot here, you have to make no commitment. Yeah. If, if, if somebody came along, and it's typically, it'll be a trusted source of yours that would get your attention for all these folks that wonder why Glenn may not answer my, or this A&R person may not answer your phone calls because you, you get a lot of, but if somebody presented you with a great artist and a great song, would you go out and do a spec deal? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything I do is essentially that. Um, when I made Jagged Little Pill, it was a spec deal. We, we, Alanis didn't have a record, she was not under record contract. She had a publishing deal, and it was basically a couple of songwriters writing for her as an artist, mm -hmm. but un not under the supervision of a record company. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that uh, in that case, it was completely a spec thing, mm -hmm. and that the reason for me that it sounds the way it does is because it wasn't being made as a product. Mm -hmm. It was simply being made as music. Yeah. And we figured out later what the product was going to be, but... Mostly it was about an honest musical expression, you know. That's a great segue that I wanted to talk to you, you know. So, producer, hopefully we answered your question there, Corey. Um, you know, you talked about Alanis, and, and she, 
you know, when I was going through your long history of, of work that you've done, you have a ton of collaborations um, with other artists. You know, obviously one of the most notable ones is Alanis Morissette, and I want to talk about it, but there was also Man in the Mirror with Saida Garrett and so forth. Um, when you're collaborating with other artists, you know, what, are the, what makes it work on one hand, and, and somewhere along the line on all those collaborations, there were probably some that you might have made it through on the professional side, but it wasn't working creatively. Talk about what are the key elements of a successful collaboration with another artist? I think the first thing is trust and respect. You have to trust and respect the person you're with. And if you do that, you're very likely going to get something special out of it. Mm. The whole idea of getting together with someone is, is, is to expand your gene pool creatively. And just like when human beings are created, it's the combination of a couple of DNA strands mm. that get together and create something absolutely new. I really feel like that happens when people who are sincere and who are, are sort of not ego-driven get together and share their creativity, it's the most powerful thing I know. Mm -hmm. The best stuff I'll ever do will be with someone else. There's no mm -hmm. question about mm -hmm. it. And I've written hundreds of songs by myself, some of them quite accomplished, but I think it's an exponential thing when you get with the right person because they're gonna give you something that you can never do and you're gonna do the same thing. And so out of that, the thing becomes an exponential. So. I love collaborations and it's really about trust and, and respect and then, then it, it, amazing things happen. Let me ask you this, you know, as a non-musician, right, it, but having, in meeting and knowing a few songwriters over there, you mentioned, you know, Elton John and Bernie Toppin. Elton John was the music, Bernie Toppin was the lyrics. Um, Tom Kelly, a friend of ours, he was the melody, music guy, you know, Billy Steinberg was the lyrics. Do you work on both sides, or do you have yeah. a specialty when you were working with somebody like Alanis? Boy, here's a hook, or here's a with, lyrical with hook. With Alanis, she's writing most of, uh, almost all the lyrics, mm -hmm. and um, and I'm on the music side. But every single situation is different for me mm -hmm. because some people think of me as a lyricist. I mean, I've written for composers as a lyricist, but I'm really a musical guy, so that helps me as a lyricist. I mean, I. I studied poetry seriously. That my mm -hmm. whole background is like English lit. So that part of it, I have this deep grounding in in words. And so for me, music and words together has always been the most magical thing. So I'm I'm happy to do either one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right? some some people think of me as the music guy. Some people think of it as the word guy. And I'm, I'm either one. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So you mentioned earlier that you, there was a, a, a funny story about how you and Alanis Morissette got hooked up. Do we kind of, maybe I'm losing my mouth. Do we cover that? No. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Let's talk certainly. about how you met uh, Alanis. It's been, what, 20 years now? And she sold, what, exactly 30, 20 years. 3 million copies yeah, on that record? Exactly little Pill is the biggest album I've been involved with. And um, there couldn't have been too many more. Maybe Michael Jackson was bigger. Who was bigger? I can't even think. I mean, a I was on the album. Bad Record, which was like in the 25 million yeah. range. I think Jagged Little Pill. Someone told me it sold 38 million records. I, you know, I hope we did. <laughs> no, um, your manager is checking to make sure yeah, you got we're, paid we're on gonna, all We're going to do an, an audit <laughs> right yeah. now. But I, I think it's all about the publishers. I mean, I'm such a song-oriented person that to me, songs are everything. And so, I, this is a shout out for all the great publishers out there. Yeah. MCA Music, which is now Universal, they saved me so many times all along the way because they believed in me as a songwriter. And all of my dark days, they, they were always shining, shining some sunshine into it. So, it's a result of my publisher that mm -hmm. I wrote with Alanis Morissette. She was signed uh, out of the publishing company in Toronto. They sent her down to LA to write with some of the LA writers. Mm -hmm. I happened to be one mm -hmm. of them. It clicked. Mm -hmm. 
So it was all because of that meeting, and it was all because we, because of our publishers. Yeah. See, it's interesting again to hear that, and I love talking to musicians about. It. I, you know, I wanted to spend all my time with a bunch of business hacks, but it's the same elements, the key elements we talked about from the get go: the networking, the making friends, the the doing the things, having people. People don't understand what publishers do. So for all you folks out there, the publisher, that it's that connecting, it's being in that flow that makes these great things happen. And as we talked about, you know, since Atlanta. Morris, it has been 20 years now. That was really almost the beginning of the end of the, the, the music business, that old music business that everybody refers to fondly, you know. Um, and uh, those great songs last forever. Let me ask you another question here, you know, that we talk about. Um, Everybody has an idea of how a song hits them. I'm always, in, I, I'm a big believer in listening to the doers, right? And when, so if I ask you, Glenn, to describe in kind of a classroom motif, what are the key elements of a great song for you? I mean, it might be different for some person today, but for somebody who's made a living and a great living doing this and, and a passion about it, what, what makes a great song for you? What was the songs that got your attention when you were a kid growing up? I mean, for me, it's, it's a supercharged emotional thing that it, it can deliver emotional meaning to you that you can't find any other way. Mm -hmm. For me, it's when you have an emotion that can't be expressed, a, a great song is usually, the, <laughs> for me, the greatest substitute for what I'm feeling. And, and it seems to, the magic of music is such that it seems to, to be in, in inextricably tied to human emotion. And, and so, for me, a great song usually delivers one idea very powerfully, and it's mm -hmm. usually like one feeling, one moment. Um, you could take a, a song like The Thrill Is Gone by B.B. Mm -hmm. King, one of the great yeah. blues songs of all time. Mm -hmm. The Thrill Is Gone says it all right there. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Thrill Is Gone. Yeah. I mean, good Lord. I mean, uh -huh. when I heard that song, I, it knocked me off my chair because mm -hmm. it was like, it was, it was like haiku poetry. Mm -hmm. And songwriting to me is, is supercharged poetry, which is it's dense and it's just chock full of meaning. And so in a three minute power packed sort of delivery of emotion, that's what songs do. So, I mean, I, for me, great songwriting always gives you a perspective on something that maybe you didn't have. And certainly for me as a musician, anytime I hear something interesting, I'm interested. You know. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. Well, you know, they hear you say, you know, those great songs. You, you they, 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 they create these snapshots in your mind. So, and I was reading some of the stuff about Alanis Morrison. There were a couple of writers talking about, you know, that those those snapshots of that particular time, that particular space where that connection was made. There. Uh, speaking of connections being made here, uh, we have a lady who's been on the phone patiently waiting, racking up her long distance charge. I hope you're on VOIP. Another my fine uh, technical. Logical advance. Who do we have on there with us, Kira? We got Diamond from Michigan. Diamond from Michigan. Diamond, you're on with Don. Be uh, Don <laughs> you're on with Glenn Ballard here, please. Diamond from Hi. Michigan. Hi. How are you guys doing? Awesome. My name is Diamond Martinez, and I'm calling from Detroit, Michigan. The Motor City. My name is Diamond Martinez. Hi. And um, I'm an artist, and I like to ask Glenn, how can I pitch some of my music for him to check out and critique? Well, um, send it, send it, and I'll listen to it. I mean, you, you had enough initiative to get through on this call. I'd love to hear your music, yeah. I'll tell you it. what you should do, uh, Diamond. You can give your email address to Kira, and she'll tell you how to get it, and I'll make sure it gets to Glenn there, all right? You got any other questions while we got you there? Oh, I just want to thank him for coming to the show, and it's really great and awesome that he took out his important time to come to the show and answer people questions like mine, and I love him, and great success, and congratulations on how successful you are, and you're, you're our role model, and keep doing what you do. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. That's so sweet. I, I don't know what to say other than thank you for liking the music, you know. And Diane, I'm going to, uh, Diamond, I'm kind of losing my marbles today. Diamond, I'm going to thank you for calling in today and being bold. All right, that's good stuff. You want to get somewhere in the no. music, but that's a great start. Got to have some initiative. Okay. Um, thanks for the call. There. Anything else on the chat room there, Kira? 
I promised Glenn I would get him out of here on the hour mark today. I'm hell bent. We are dead on track here. It's really scaring the shit out of me, Code, you know? It's, uh, why don't you just turn everything off Smooth for five sailing. minutes, okay? Yeah. Who else we got, Kira? Um, we got a Johnny from Miami. Johnny from right. Miami. He wants to know, in terms of creating original content for television, what tips or advice would you suggest in getting a foot in the door? Whom are the type of people in advertising industry you would need to con contact, network with? Great question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, music supervisors are generally responsible for putting all kinds of songs into television shows and movies. I don't have a list of music supervisors, but I know that there's, if you do some investigating, that's a, you could probably find 20 of the people who are supplying most mm -hmm. of the music. And I can tell you that the television licensing thing is, is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a worthwhile goal to try to figure out mm -hmm. a way for people who are vetting music for shows and for commercials, it's certainly a worthwhile place mm. to, to, to spend your time trying to get into. I don't have a specific name, but I think it's a very good approach to be thinking of how you can use your songs that way, as opposed to just making a record and putting it out and trying to be the artist promoting it. Having, so yeah, I mean, it's first of all, it's a very good approach to to keep that in mind. I think a lot of indie artists get a crack today oh, yeah. because of, of the finances of the TV business that maybe wasn't the case 20 years ago. TV has been a great friend to music at this point. I mean, it, it probably doing as much for us as anything, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Any other questions over there, Kira? Yeah, hold on. We got a, we got a bunch. Um, all right, I have a good one from Drum Beats. My question for Glenn, what's some advice on how to manage creating music that sells and is mainstream now versus <laughs> creating music for my own enjoyment and passion? That's a great question for somebody who makes a living doing this. I, I honestly, I mean, I, I have kind of a different answer for that. My, my situation is, is that there's a huge rush toward everything sounding the same right now. As, I call it like over conformity. And I think going forward, being, being a little different is important actually, because I think you, if you're competing in the mainstream with a lot of records that are 120 beats a minute, four on the floor, kick drum, very little melodic content, pretty much a lot of that sounds alike and the winners of those kinds of records are going to be the companies and the artists who have the most muscle and it won't be a competition that's fair <laughs> your only hope is to have something that's different mm -hmm. and i really i'm just a counter programmer by nature so i mean there's two ways to approach it listen to the the top five hit songs and essentially try to copy it without copyright infringement in terms of like the tone the sense of it that's one way to go but mm -hmm. i don't do that myself mm -hmm. I prefer, as a musician, to try to do something that's completely different from that, but that would still be able to compete with that. Now, how do you do that? That's the $64,000 question. That's what I try to do every day, is to cr create something that's commercial and different. Because something that's different, that still gets over, those are the things that set trends. That's when you change the music business. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say to the, to the listener, be bold. Don't, I mean, you can go ahead and try to make music that sounds like exactly what, what's out there, but why would you? I mean, uh, the great artists, it seems to me, um, we're always either slightly ahead of, or we're certainly leading the parade. And when you're out a little bit ahead, it's probably a bit lonely. Yeah. But it's been my experience, having worked briefly on the inside of a record label, by the time you've calculated what's happening now, it's already changed. So you're constantly chasing the tail. And I, I, I subscribe to, to Mr. Ballard's take here. Be who you are and believe it. And uh, in that's, that should be your guiding light, right? I mean, I, at the end I, of the day. I think otherwise you're constantly, you're, you're trying to present something that isn't authentic. I think mm. you'd be much more successful giving it your real juice and making that really good, you know? Yeah. And it, it's, um, 
And at the end of the day, doesn't it still, no matter whether it's, it's funny, I watch EDM and I see the hip hop slash pop world, right? And what's interesting for me, and I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on EDM or, or hip hop, but the songs that have been the commercial successes wind up incorporating the same elements that you described earlier. A melody of some sort, a lyric that tugs at your heart or speaks to you in a way that, that feels genuine, right? And then they wrap an EDM you know, back, background to it, Avicii, you know, exactly. or some of these songs, Calvin Harris, Blame It on the Night. Christ, I'm singing that song down the street, I'm going, Blame It! And I'm going, why? Is that EDM or is that just a great song? Exactly. Well, it's, it starts with the DNA of a great song, you know. Perfect. Okay. Um, I want to ask you, we're all just about on track. I want to ask you, we had a conversation the other day as well. Kira is going to be leaving the chat room, folks. So you're on your own now. You're stuck with me. Um, uh, we talked about you know how things have changed and how some things haven't changed much at all. And you made an interesting comment that it, that in today's world, you thought it was important more so than ever that artists and songwriters and so forth need to, in, as you put it, invest in musicianship. Talk about that, if you would. It starts with the fact that essentially everybody can create music now. That was not always the case. In the digital world, it's, if you have GarageBand, you can essentially make a record that sounds pretty, pretty good. You'll be in tune, it'll be perfectly in tune, it'll be perfectly in time. And essentially everyone can do that. So everybody can create something that sounds pretty good. But what's really important, I think right now, is since that everybody can do it, is that the people that really can do it better are probably musicians. And so I think on some level, musicianship has been pushed to the side in the service of compelling, easy, interesting to listen to 10 second snippets of music. But music is more than 10 seconds. So I, my feeling is that if you're in music and you're a musician, don't be afraid to be musical. I mean, you may not be hearing a lot of quote music as we sort of think of it traditionally, but that's your advantage. Otherwise, you're competing with a less musical landscape and a less interesting landscape and a less varied and rich landscape. So I think you, you open up the possibilities of what your music can be compared to everyone else if you do use the music that you've maybe been like pushing aside. Nobody likes major seven chords, but maybe you can figure out a way to use a major seven chord. And it would sound so different because you did that. So I'm... I just think that music is always going to, going to win out. Mm -hmm. And if you're a musician, do the investigation as a musician of like how to be better, be chromatic when you can, use an interesting chord change, don't be afraid to be melodic, and figure out a way to use that vocabulary and, and still get it over. I mean, this is the great challenge. This is my challenge as a musician. I, still, I, I, I live with it every day of trying to find a way to convince you that this is this is the way it should go. And, and that's also always including the listener in it. Even though you're leading the dance, you want them to dance with you, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a tricky thing, but I would never accept anything less than trying to go for something that's great. And I think that you sort of have to have that mindset. I want this to be great every time, and I'm willing to give it the sweat equity that requires, greatness requires a huge amount of sweat equity. <laughs> so it ain't, it ain't ever gonna be easy, you know? Yeah, and I think people, it's funny to hear you say it because so many people are looking, I don't wanna say a shortcut, they're looking for a checklist and as we talked earlier, it's easy to look at a Glenn Ballard finished product and think I wanna do that and miss all the work and the sweat and the drama and the pain and, and suffering and ups and downs that, that if you haven't figured it out, folks, you know, come with, come with the business here. Let me ask you another question here. We've got a couple minutes left here. Um, you've written some big hits. You're a great musician. You've played on all these great records. But what's striking to me is that and, and I think it kind of dovetails with this notion of investing in musicianship and taking it to different places. You're involved, you wrote a, a screenplay and, a, and produced a movie back in the day. You wrote a big movie, big, big song for Polar Express, Believe. Uh, you, you put together a Broadway musical with Dave Stewart, uh, another one of my uh, faves. Are these all just extensions of that same music man looking for a place to play? I, I, absolutely. I mean... Music 
is just looking for places to, to be heard, you know, mm. and we have to compete with a lot of other noise out there, but yes, I mean, for me, music still is about presenting music live whenever possible. Mm. Even though I've made a, a, a huge living with recorded music, at the end of the day, I think music's future is in live presentation and everything that we do sort of leads up to that. And I think if you're not willing to make the commitment to making music live, it's very hard, you know. You sort of have to understand that as musicians, what we do is play music for people. Mm. And that's an active thing and it's, on some level, it's not a virtual experience, you know. When it's really good, people in a room making music is, is still important. It, I, I started as a concert program. I was what inspired me was watching the Rolling Stones live and I had all their records, but well, I've been in the same room with them. Um, it was a life changer for me. Uh, speaking of life changers, we've got one final question here from one of our viewers. Is It was a simple one, but thoughtful one. I want to play it for you or show it to you. Um, it was LJP Works he wanted to know, Glenn, what is the biggest re reward you have received personally inside of you from your career? And I suppose she's speaking about intrinsic, not financial rewards. It's just the... Uh the gift of being able to work with the greatest singers in the world. There's no question. I've spent my whole career around these voices that have elevated my work, and I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. Mm. Uh, because, you know, some of the voices that, that will live way beyond us mm. have been singing my songs. So that, mm. for me, is to, it, to hear Michael Jackson singing Man in the Mirror <laughs> at the end of his concert, that would, I mean, for me, I just felt like I was part of something much greater than myself. Mm -hmm. And so hearing the singer sing the songs, that's it for me. It's good work if you can get it, huh? It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, be before we leave, though, next uh, in July, we're coming up on our third anniversary of doing Red Man Live. So we've got some shows we'll be announcing shortly for July. But I want to take a moment to thank all those folks that have actually been a part of this whole thing. Uh, I want to thank you, Glenn, for uh, being here today and sharing some wonderful bits of wisdom and insight. I want to thank my friend, Mr. Cody Romnus, back there. Kira had to blast out. She's becoming a manager, and she had to go out on a manager's meeting today and I'm happy to let her out of class. Uh, I want to thank all you folks for watching as well. I'm going to go, this has been a great morning for me to, to talk a little bit about music business, meet some old friends, and now I'm going to go out and play some golf, folks, which is my version of being a musician. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Today. Um, my name's Steve Rennie. The program's called Red Man Live. The website's called redmanmusicandbusiness.com, and I am out of here. Thanks for joining what it is those labels are looking for when they sign an artist. First and foremost, they're all looking for great, unique talent. It seems obvious that labels would want great, unique music, and everybody is going to have...